Welcome to uh, the Newman Center here. I'm Father Blazik. I work with Father Pat Marshall here. And uh, we've been here at UIC 700 Morgan Street for many, many years, since the 70s. One of the activities we run is called the Integritas Institute. And the Integritas Institute runs both bioethics lectures and business ethics lectures that um, are programs that support the learning in the university environment but they're aside from the formal curriculum. So we're really grateful for you to come, coming, and we we'll hope we'll see you at future events. Today's speaker, and we're going to welcome her, is Liz Yore. Liz Yore is really an expert on exploitation, on human trafficking, on the exploitation of children and protecting them. She has worked both at the national level and here in Chicago area at the DCFS, the De uh, Department of Children and Family Services, protecting vulnerable persons, particularly children, in the region and in Chicago. She was Oprah Winfrey's in-house counsel at, at Harpo because Oprah's been so active in the field. So really a great asset and resource. We're so grateful for her time. Why don't you give her a hand and we'll get started. Hi everybody, I'm thrilled to be here, um, even though we're talking about kind of a tough topic. Um, but I, uh, Father wanted it to be um, focused on the business angle, which is actually quite easy because uh, human trafficking is um, big business. Um, what is probably one of the fastest growing criminal businesses in the world, um, quickly to outpace guns and drugs. Now, just think about it for a minute. When you cross borders, you, you've got to hide the guns because immediately guns will be found. If you're crossing a border with drugs, you've got to hide the drugs. But when you're crossing borders with human beings, you don't have to hide them. So that's why it's become, for many other reasons, which I'll get into, it's become um, this fastest growing business. So the big business of human trafficking and we like to call it modern slavery, hiding in plain uh, sight. Um, tonight I want to talk to you, you know, it's true, I worked for Oprah, and probably some of you know that oftentimes when you go to Oprah's show, there's gifts under the chair. No, no <laughs> gifts today. Um, you know, and I'm not going to hand out keys to cars, which he had done in the past, but tonight I'd like to pull back the curtain on human trafficking and show you the keys in faces of human trafficking. Here's a, um... I was promised a better life, far away from my home. I used to have a family. Now, I must pay for my family's debts. I sleep with many men every day. They make me kill for a war. Work many long hours. Trapped, beaten, scared, locked in the dark. With no way out. I want to go home. I want my freedom. 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 recognize uh, the actress Emma Thompson in the many, many voices, men, women, and children um, of human trafficking. And I think that public service announcement captures the complexity and the many layers that in, are involved in human trafficking. Um, my work in human trafficking really um, it was a journey into Middle Earth because nothing seemed as it appeared to be. Um, a relatively simple search for a missing child turned into an international manhunt for our trafficking victim. I worked many local cases here in Chicago, and I was told, well, this is a runaway, this child will be somewhere um, in the Chicago area. And oftentimes, those searches began international manhunts. One in particular, I recall, children who were trafficked to Ghana and to Nigeria. And looking for missing teens in the streets of Chicago, I often found when we recovered them that they had been trafficked around the world. Trafficking is all around us, but no one sees it. 
we see these victims, but we don't know that they're being trafficked. You know, probably, you've heard it, everybody's talking about human trafficking, but few are doing anything about it. Here are some of the grim statistics, and since many of you are business students, I wanted to share with you um, kind of the grim reality of human trafficking um, around the world. There are 800,000 who are trafficked over borders every year, a million children trafficked in sex every year, 50% of the trafficking victims are children. It's a $32 billion global enterprise. And the entry into sex trafficking and prostitution is 12 years old. Now, um, because it's a concealed crime, very few people really know the statistics. Most of these are estimates, so you know, during the course you may see different, different numbers, but um, there are approximately 30 million people around the world involved in human trafficking, both sex and um, labor trafficking. This is 30 million people are slaves, half in India. You know, much of the manufacturing in the United States, call centers are moving to um, India, um, and there's some very, very bad um, human trafficking, labor trafficking situations that I wanted to talk about. What is labor trafficking? Because let's first talk about labor trafficking, and then let's get into sex trafficking. There are millions of people, as you can see from these headlines, who are victims of forced labor trafficking. They're trapped in jobs, they're coerced or deceived into these jobs that they cannot leave. Labor trafficking is a term that's used by the International Labor, labor Organization. It involves men, it involves women and girls and boys, children, and they're made to work against their free will, coerced into horrible uh, working situations with threats of violence. Their identity papers are oftentimes taken. Um, they're lured into these jobs with promises of great pay. And when they get in the, these jobs, they can't leave. As business students, I hope that you would be interested in this issue. You know, here in Chicago, there's an expression, good politics is good government. You may have heard it. I don't know how well we uh, keep to that um, expression. The same is true in corporations. Good corporate governance is good for business. You don't want to face headlines like this. Um, you don't want your board of directors, your shareholders, um, seeing headlines like this, which is a headline that appeared in January of this year. Major corporations, corp um, big international corporations that were facing child slavery um, charges in January of 2014. So while the bottom line may be one where you don't want to look at what's really happening um, in uh, these countries, but you cannot afford as a corporate executive to have headlines like this because your stock will go plummeting and before you know it, you'll be out of a job. The global picture of labor slaves really boggles the mind, but it's a reality <coughs> of business and it's something that the corporate world has to deal with. Sweatshops, poor and unsafe buildings, working conditions, poor wages, working hours are conditions that foster human slavery. And many of these are in legitimate businesses. Let's look at the numbers. These are the numbers, as best we know, from the International Labor Organization in the various continents of where the, the numbers of human slaves. But, you know, is the United States complicit in this behavior? Here are some companies, and I think you'll recognize them, that have been known to have manufacturing sweatshops overseas, Gap, Nike, Walmart, Sears, Cole, um, even sometimes um, Apple. Um, and so what has happened is they've had to endure, and rightly so, terrible headlines because they've exposed the kind of sweatshops, poor working conditions. There was a terrible, in Bangladesh, there was a terrible um, building that had a number of American sweatshops working, manufacturing clothing, and the, sweat, the, built, the entire building, I think it was a five-story building, collapsed. 1,500 people were killed. So with more, and you're going to cross, 
cross this path when you're out in the working world. More and more corporations are outsourcing work overseas in everything from customer service, service assistance to manufacturing, agricultural fields. Business must be vigilant to ensure that these global outposts maintain U.S. labor standards and prevent child and forced labor situations. Sound ethical business practices and a strong corporate ethic, which I think Father teaches from time to time here, ensures that the dignity of the employee does not get sacrificed for the profitable bottom line. If you dig down in these numbers, you're going to find that there are millions and millions of people that are being exploited in the private economy by both individuals and enterprises. And among these labor victims, many are involved in um, forced sexual exploitation. And the newest purveyor of not only human trafficking for sex, but human trafficking for labor is ISIS. Um, we're, we know that they're exceeding $3 million a day by kidnapping women and children and selling them into forced marriages, selling them into the human trafficking um, market. So this is a new purveyor in this whole field of human trafficking. It's going to be um, you know, exploited. We're going to see more and more of this. You've probably seen the headlines, Boko Haram abducting women and children, ISIS going into villages in Iraq and Syria, grabbing the women and children. These women and children disappear and are never seen again. But we have our problems here in Chicago. Chicago is a major trafficking hub. It's a major trafficking hub because traffickers look for cheap labor. And it's easy for victims to hide in large metropolitan areas like Chicago. Chicago's foreign-born population is 1.6 million. But in our metropolitan area, the large, with the large um, counties, it's 10 million. The gross metropolitan gross product in Chicago is $571 billion. And that equals the entire gross national budget of Iran. So when you're in a, in a big city like Chicago, it gives you some global perspective of how um, Chicago can serve as a metropolitan transportation hub. And another thing about Chicago is that it has a lot of 3D jobs. Now, and I don't mean techie jobs. 3D jobs are dirty jobs, difficult jobs, and dangerous jobs. Traffickers look for those kinds of um, opportunities moving trafficking victims primarily in labor um, into a big metropolitan area where can they, they fade into the wall, they handle these jobs, they take these jobs for low wages. 10, 15 people can be housed in one small apartment. And the, coal, the Chicago Coalition on Homelessness estimates that more than 6,000 children are trafficked each year in Cook County. And in the metropolitan area of Chicago, there are 16,000 to 25,000 women and girls who are involved in the commercial sex trade. One third of these girls enter prostitution at age 14, 15. And in Chicago, with the thousands of women and children that are being trafficked into, this, um, into the city, there is one one trafficking, anti-trafficking house, safe house for these girls, and it houses seven girls. So you do the numbers. There's just no resources available to pull these kids out of trafficking, get them in a safe house, rehabilitate them, get them new jobs. So it's an enormous problem. Again, everybody's talking about it, but the concrete way to save lives, to intervene in their lives, very little is being done. Well, as business majors, you're probably interested in the bottom line. As I said, it's a um, $32 billion um, operation. And, oh, hold on, I'm going to get back here. Hold on, let me, let me just go down here. I want you to see the blurred lines between sex trafficking. Okay, let's see if I can. 
the blurred lines between sex trafficking and labor trafficking. This video shows We have breaking news. Local children were rescued from a human trafficking operation in Pinellas County. Martinez was held captive for months, forced to work for free when he couldn't pay a smuggling fee. Four women rescued today from a forced prostitution operation in Treasure Island. The victims were beaten and tricked out of their money. Raped, forced to work on a farm for no pay. 30 victims live in a small shack outside of the farm. And you should know that human trafficking is the second most lucrative crime in the world today. <coughs> it's hard to believe that in the 21st century, slavery is still amongst us, right here in Tampa Bay. So that's a PSA, um, public service announcement, that appeared in Tampa Bay, but it could be repeated in any metropolitan area. Um, so how does the most sophisticated, most technologically savvy country, most educated era in the civilization of time, find itself, here we are, in, the, in an exploding crisis of modern slavery? How does this happen in a time in history when we are drenched in human rights, lingu language, lingo, treaties, civil rights, laws, policy? How is it with instant global communication, we can't figure out how to stop the human trafficking pandemic? The International Criminal Court says it's a crime against humanity. How is it that postmodern 2014, We've never seen so many people enslaved in human, sla in human history. Even more than the 400 years where there was transatlantic um, slave trade. The commodities involved children, men, women, and their traffic short dist distances and long distances within the United States, within small towns. There's no area that's immune from human trafficking. Children here in the United States are trafficked all over the world, all over South America, um, all over the East, and um, into Asia. They're trafficked within India, and they're trafficked to Cambodia and Russia, and Cambodians and Russians come to the United States. Here's the sad reality. There is little difference between human trafficking on the streets of the South Shore um, of Chicago and the southern shores of Thailand. The traffickers' goal, whether in Phnom Penh or in Peoria, is to maximize profits through the physical and mental exploitation of their victims. The answer to these questions is money, access, and probably most importantly, demand. The face of human trafficking in the United States, the victims are oftentimes unwitting, primarily children and women against their will into prostitution, involuntary servitude, degrading and inhuman labor, debt bondage, cyber sex, pornography, false and illegal adoption, the theft and sale of newborn babies, surrogacy, illegal harvesting of and commerce of, of human organs. Within minutes of this very campus, they're human trafficking victims walking the streets. Human trafficking is nothing but a confounding web of contradictions. It's secret and concealed, yet it's open and notorious. Traffickers who are highly sophisticated, oftentimes in organized crime organizations, and many being two-bit street thugs who abuse and use women and exploit them and make money off of them. So let's look at this next um, trailer that I want to show you. It's a trailer of a documentary entitled Playground. And it's one that I was involved in. Um, and it shows in kind of graphic detail, so prepare yourself, about what really goes on. Many of these victims are from the US. Many are from um, the city of Chicago. And the title really captures the um, I'd say the domination of the world of the pimp as he exploits women and children in his playground.
I got started when I was 13. I was really young, and the people that fought me were people that were looking for, you know, child fetishes. There was like 15 of them in a room, and I was really scared. He cut with a knife to be able to penetrate me. I was only five. I was crying because I was scared, and he had sex with me. And that was my first time. I still had on my school uniform. Cambodia have 99.9% of the time already abused children in their own country. documentary and providing um, children to speak um, to the producer, it dawns on you that there is really a lot that the average person can do. Um, you know, here we are at a time when we can track phone calls, emails, texts, 
um, every move on our streets, but we can't seem to track human trafficking victims. We can't. We claim we can't find them. We don't have the you know consensus, the will that this is something that will not be tolerated. And after today's talk, I hope that you know you'll realize that in the United States, each person can make a difference. You can decide in your own way, in unique, creative ways, to make a difference. You remember that high-profile story, the 250 girls in um, Nigeria, Boko Haram had grabbed them um, and kidnapped them, and uh, most, if not all, are still missing. And everybody just kind of threw up their hands and said, we don't know where they are. Um, a few of the girls escaped, but to the, up to this point, we don't know where those girls are. Um, but you'll also remember another story. Remember when the Malaysian plane went down and we had 200 people on board and we had 12 countries organizing 17 ships, 19 planes, looking to find a ping in the bottom of the huge Indian Ocean. There was a consensus that we are, as a global community, going to look for and listen for and find that plane. There wasn't the same kind of consensus looking for um, poor girls who had been abducted in horrible situation in um, Nigeria. I think that kind of shows that the disconnect between um, the global community, that we need to really raise awareness as to what can be done. Um, I promised you keys, not keys to cars, but keys to kind of the, the complex dynamics of human trafficking and to recognize the various things that feed into human trafficking. Pornography. Every time you look at pornography, you're looking at a human trafficking victim. Human trafficking, pornography fuels human trafficking. Pornographers and traffickers use it to um, lure victims to lower their inhibitions, and they film the sex acts and make millions selling pornography on the internet. And people want to say, oh, what's wrong with pornography? Many children um, get lured into pornography, and it, pimps repeatedly tell us, and the girls tell us, that they film their children and sell the videos, and the girls aren't obviously getting the money, it's the pimps. So, you know, that, need, that message needs to get out into the public domain because there is a kind of, um, you know, shrug of the shoulders when people talk about um, pornography. Traffickers look for vulnerable victims, whether it's in India, whether it's in Rio de Janeiro, whether it's in the streets of Chicago, they look for young girls and boys who are looking for love. And the minute these kids hit the street, with it, you know, if a child runs away, and in some certain areas, the pimps and the traffickers drive up and down the streets. I once had a, a sexual predator who had come out of jail and wanted to <coughs> rehabilitate his life, said, I can see three kids walking down the street towards me, and I can tell you of those three kids, which one is a vulnerable kid that I can get. Just by looking at them, I just know. <coughs> so they have that sixth sense. They can spot vulnerable kids. And most of the underage kids are um, girls, but more and more we're seeing young boys being lured into, um, into this field. Another area where kids are extremely vulnerable is in foster care. Um, foster care has you know, kids run away in foster care. Um, up to a few years ago in Illinois, those of us in, in foster care, DCFS, um, never even reported children missing. Can you imagine, these are children um, who are in our care, in our guardianship, and when they went on the run, or went, you know, on the run, and went missing, nobody reported them to law enforcement, nobody looked for them. Well, that's changed in Illinois, thankfully, but there are many states that don't report to law enforcement foster care children who go on the run. And in fact, in LA, they d in LA, they did a study looking at the underage population involved in human trafficking. 60% of the kids were from the foster care system. 
So we know that these children are vulnerable. We know that we need to continue to build safety nets for them so that they don't turn to the streets for love, attention, and affection. Because the minute they hit the streets, the traffickers use violence, threats of force, promises, lures, drugs, whatever they can to hook these kids. And once they're hooked, it's nearly impossible to leave. And I, I would suggest to you that this is, since this is such a big business, that we need to follow the money. Um, according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, where I used to work, each pimp, and this goes in, the, in Chicago too, makes about $150,000 to $200,000 a year on four to six girls. Um, Pimps in San Diego make e sometimes even more. It's a big business, and it's very lucrative. When I started off looking for missing kids, I thought you know I'd be able to find them very quickly. What I didn't realize were that many of these kids were involved in human trafficking. And what happens was, because there's so much money involved, we would see furs, BMWs, million dollar homes, pocket full of cash, the girls didn't have any of these things. It was the pimps. Million dollar homes in the south side, southern suburbs of Chicago. It's not like pretty women. There'd be five to six girls who were being trafficked nightly. They would be the ones in these flea bag apartments and hotels, and the pimps would be living the lap of luxury. Um, we once had a girl who was 12 years old and got lured into human trafficking. She was an adorable little chubby girl. Um, and after a month, um, the police found her and brought her in. We didn't recognize her. She had lost 40 pounds. And when one of the investigators said, how did you lose 40 pounds? Did they not feed you? And her response was, when you walk the streets for eight hours every day you lose 40 pounds in a month. So that's the kind of life that we're dealing with. But how do we recognize the signs? I, I bet, I bet, whether you knew it or not, that you, you probably crossed the path of a, a traffic victim. They're not free to come and go as they want. Many are under 18. They're unpaid or paid very little. They work excessively long hours or unusual hours. You know, we all drive down the street and maybe at night and see, you know, girls who look like they're um, involved in prostitution. We laugh, we scoff, keep on driving. It's, you know, really incumbent upon us to make that call to the state's attorney's office, make that call to the local police department, and, and let them know that the average person cares about these women, and, and many of whom are children. And we need to really figure out ways in which we can intervene in their lives. And you know, the internet has become the great global marketplace, as we saw on that, um, on that video. With a click of a mouse, children and women can be ordered up for rape, for exploitation. Girls are trafficked within hours around the world. Traffic victims can also be found in legitimate businesses such as you know um, nail salons, um, going into into restaurants, they have an immediate marketplace to connect with their victims. You know, in the old days, it was extremely difficult to connect with victims. Now it isn't, um, but no one's really making a dent in the tide of human trafficking. I mean, there's a lot of people talking about it, myself included, but very few people are doing anything. It's the logical consequence, I believe, of a world awash in exploitation of women and children through prostitution, pornography, surrogacy, abortion, and exploitation. Why is human trafficking exploding around the globe? It seems that modern men and women have declared war on children. Globalization allows, allows criminals to roam free. The world has commodified human beings they're discarded, they're disposed of, and then we're shocked that they're abused in this marketplace of human trafficking. But I don't want to leave you with a negative, just this negative story. You've seen enough. Because you are the young people, you're the next generation. 
And I want to talk about some creative ways that business people, your average business person, intervened in the lives of children to save lives. Let's ask you this. If you're a CEO of a hotel chain, what are you going to do when you hear that high-priced prostitutes are filling your hotel rooms? Will you turn a blind eye? Will you ignore it? What are you going to do as a CEO of a manufacturing company when you find out that you have a, found a great manufacturing company in India that, ha, that is using child labor, but the price point is the lowest that you could find anywhere in the world? Are you still going to use that manufacturer? Will you ignore all of this because it's good for the bottom line in business? How will you tolerate and will you ignore an employee who serves pornographic sites all day long in the office? This happens all the time. What if he's your highest producing sales representative? Will you still tolerate it? Will you disregard his behavior? Will you keep him on the payroll? Will you train your employees to recognize the signs of human tra trafficking? What if there are constant rumors in the workplace about an employee who travels to Thailand to have sex with little boys? What will you do? These are all real life scenarios. And I'm sure that you'll face one or more of them in the business world. There are countless others. Will you ignore the signs or boldly take action? Let's play these out for a minute. If you ignore the employee who boldly serves porn sites because he's your highest valued sales producer, you may be barring a major sex discrimination lawsuit by the women in the office who are complaining about the sexual harassment and a hostile work environment. Your inaction may provide an initial bump in sales because of this guy, but legal fees, settlements, bad publicity, like Cargill, like Nestle, like ADM, are far more costly in the long run. When sound ethical judgments are brought into the workplace, it's ultimately good for business and for the bottom line. Make your career choice a vocation. A vocation is the sacred and hallowed place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Vocation inhabits the life and the world. It's that inner voice, you know it, you've heard it, which calls you to the outer world to make a difference. Here in America, one person, one person can make a difference. Through tragedy like John Walsh, who's um, went after missing children, there was no legislation. His son is probably named after five or six pieces of legislation. One man who suffered a tragedy, whose son was abducted and murdered. He was a salesman, a, a used car salesman. He didn't know anything about criminal law. And yet, because of this tragedy, he tra transformed the laws of this country. I want to show you these are some of the ads, if you're in advertising, um, an anti-trafficking poster that was created because in Indiana there's a lot of truck stops and what happens is these young girls come knocking on the cab doors and go in and um, ask, to, ask for sex. So one of the ad executives created um, a poster. If you're into ad, you know, advertising, graphics, these are some of the things that you can do. All right, we've been through this. I want to show you. I must. Oh, I think I'm going. Hold on. Okay. Strip clubs, massage parlors, escort service, they all use underage trafficking victims. Street pot prostitution, as I mentioned, involves trafficking victims. Every prostitute enters prostitution as a minor. Backpage, Facebook, Craigslist, all foster prostitutions, and have been subject to a lot of lawsuits. So these are all areas where think about if there is a role for you to play going forward in, in your lives. But I want to show you the positive side. 
the creative solutions that you, each one of you, will come up with. We had a businessman who sent out those little Advo flyers. You may have seen them in the mail. We used to say, oh, they're junk mail and throw them in the garbage. Well, on this part, let me just show you. On this part was the address name. On the back side, you know, he'd sell um, carpet cleaning for 10% off. But he had this blank space in the middle, uh, in, the, in the front part. And he realized all of a sudden, I could put pictures of missing children on those cards. <coughs> they go to 100 million homes in the United States. So this bu businessman who had what everybody would call a junk mail business decided and contacted the National Center and said, give me pictures of your missing children. I'm going to put that picture in front of 100 million homes in Chicago or in the United States. And what happened is hundreds of children have been found because of this little piece of junk mail and that a guy who used his vocation, a business vocation, and thought, I can make a difference. I can go the extra mile. Obviously, it cost him more money, but what has happened is that children who never would have been found were found because of him. You may have heard of age progression software. There was a technology guy who created for Revlon. Revlon said, we want um, a software program that we can put on um, at Neiman Marcus and all, in all the department stores that shows a woman's face aging. And then we want to be able to use our makeup and show how the, the makeup covers all the aging process. So this guy made a lot of money creating this age progression software. And one day it occurred to him, I can use this to find missing kids. Many missing children are gone for a long time. So if a child is abducted at two, in five years you can't put a picture of a two-year-old. You don't want the public looking for a two-year-old. You want a, the public looking for an eight-year-old. And so using age progression software, you see Madeline McCann up there, the little girl who was abducted um, in Portugal, still has not been found. The age progression software on the right, you're right, um, is her, I think it's been now about five years. So the public, who is, by the way, the people who find missing children, the public will look for an eight-year-old girl, not a three-year-old girl. Here's Jacob Wetterling down below, who was 11 when he went missing. He's been gone for 25 years. This is his face, now um, age progressed um, into his 30s. Again, here is an average person, wasn't in law enforcement, didn't know much, but thought, I can use my talent, my skill, my business to solve human problems. In age progression pictures, because we have the American public looking at that picture, and because it's been so successful, 900 children have been found using this software. J.C. Um, Lee D uh, Duggar, who, um, this is her age progression picture. That is her real picture on the cover. And you know, in, in the United States, one person can make a difference. It's what's great about this country. And what I wanted to urge you as, as you embark on this new and exciting life as businessmen, professionals, businesswomen in the workplace, I challenge you to create novel strategies, programs, initiatives, products even, to prevent human trafficking and to rescue vi victims. I guarantee you that you will get more happiness and satisfaction out of doing this kind of work than oftentimes many of the widgets <coughs> that, you, that you make. You're on the threshold of an amazing journey to serve humanity. This adventure that you're going to take is full of surprises and challenges. So here's my wish for you. In the words of my favorite poem and one of my favorite poets, Robert Service, Carry on, carry on. Fight the good fight and true. Believe in your mission. Greet life with a cheer. There's big work to do, and that's why you're here. Carry on, carry on. 
Let the world be better for you. And at last, when you die, let this be your cry. Carry on, my soul. Carry on. There's big work to do. Fight the good fight and be true. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. That's a really masterful treatment of that and very informative, and I learned a lot. So we have time for a few questions. If anybody would like to ask, she's available. Take two or three. Yes. Uh, how long have you uh, been doing what you're doing? Oh, you would have to ask that. <laughs> um, about 25 years. Um, and, you know, I was telling somebody, you know, when I went into the field of child advocacy, people said, oh, there's just no job opportunities. You know, it just is very limited. You're, you probably heard these things. And I've traveled the world. I've worked for, you know, Oprah Winfrey. I've worked on cases with other billionaires. I've met princes and prime ministers. I mean, so those people that said, oh, you know, there's nothing here. Um, but most importantly, I mean, the highs of I mean, going to O'Hare and finding kids who had been missing for four years, I mean, no big award settlement could ever, you know, undo the the high that I had in finding missing kids. So 25 years and it's been um, a real joy and, you know, it's obviously very frustrating and many kids that I haven't found and some sad stories, but the ones that I have, um, it's been, it's been great. Yes? Yes. Um, so you mentioned some things you can do yeah. individually, but what about different countries or maybe even different states that have more progressive mm -hmm. policies? Yeah. Um, let me give you some uh, organizations. Can you the question? I'm not yeah, uh, sure. What can, oh, what can be done individually in other states, in other organizations, overseas, other countries? Um, there are a lot of international organizations. Not a lot. There's some good um, international organizations. There's one called ECPAT, E-C-P-A-T, it's N, Child Prostitution and Tourism or something like that. Um, they're all over the world. Um, they're also in the United States. The Polaris Project um, is one that is very good. Um, there's the International Justice Mission, which actually you work in foreign countries um, a lot in um, Thailand, you know, you're, you're literally working with the um, Thailand police in rescuing women and children. Um, there's um, Salvation Army State's Attorney, U.S. Attorney here in the United, here in Chicago, he has a big um, task force, um, and so you know, there's a lot of work that can be done. There's just nothing, you know. We need the energy of young people to think of creative ways to intervene in their lives. There's, I mean, seven beds in Chicago. I mean, when you think of this, a safe home that only has seven beds and we have thousands of victims, it's, it's crazy. Um, so, um, you know, there's, you know, I'm sure people involved in um, Peace Corps, um, the UN, um, there's several organizations, you know, are involved, but those are kind of the ones that I'm familiar with and trust. Um, you know, quite frankly, there's a million kind of nonprofits that pop up, you know, but those are the ones that are really doing the work of intervening in lives and making a difference. Um, you know, just get, not just, getting the word out and doing more. Um, being foster parents, you know, at some point, it, you know, is an incredible, you know, we need good foster parents. These kids um, who have been abused and neglected get pulled out of their homes, and rightfully so, but we need to place them with loving, caring parents who will go the extra mile for them so they don't run away. Um, so those, those are some organizations. Um, create your own, you know. Um, um, that's what I'd encourage you to do. Sorry. Yes? Um, a few things. I'm a little concerned about a few of your stats because you had a statement that said everybody, when you're looking at porn, you're looking at a trafficking victim. And then you also had another stat that said everybody who is in prostitution entered at a young age. And I'm wondering what, you know, where you got that information because to me, I, I don't think that, I do a lot of work with people in the sex trade and I don't think those are correct stats. I don't believe that they are and I'm kind of, I didn't see any where you got that information from like as far as research or 
Well, you know, um, a lot of it, the re I didn't cite any of the research, but I'm involved in a lot of these cases, and involved in a lot of these cases, every single you know, girl that I certainly dealt with, and the people who work in this field, um, tell me that they, the vast majority of girls enter into prostitution at a young age. Um, pornography, um, to a woman, they are all, they used pornography to lure them in, to lower their inhibitions, and the sex acts, um, all the girls that I've worked with, they were filmed um, in pornography. Uh, another thing, I went to a presentation uh, a couple months ago by a woman named Anne Elizabeth Moore, who had done a lot of work in Cambodia, mm -hmm. at the, um, and working with anti-trafficking organizations there. And what she found was a lot of, um, I don't know if you talk about fast, what she calls fast fashion, like these uh, sportswear companies here like H&M and, uh, you know, low price clothing. Yeah. And what they found was that at the anti-trafficking uh, organization, what they were doing is taking, uh, you know, the women out of the brothels, so they were rescuing from the brothels, and then training them for jobs in manufacturing at these, uh, you know, factories that were producing this clothing and that a lot of it was funded by the companies that they were producing the clothing for. And essentially they were working, you know, they were being exploited in a labor sense right. at these factories. Um, but what they found was that they were being funded by like Columbia Sportswear, H&M, like a lot of these companies that you had talked about were involved in you know, labor trafficking. And so I'm wondering if you had any knowledge or investigation of that, because it was kind yeah. of a revelation to me that they were funding this anti-trafficking work, but then they were funneling the women, uh, you know, taking them from one situation into a factory situation where they were producing yeah. this clothing. Well, you know, yeah. I think I mentioned that both are meshed, you know. And what, what would be very interesting, and actually what there are not a lot of, and you bring up a very good point, are comp international companies that vet for there, there is, I think, one legitimate company that vets for a Macy's, a Neiman Marcus, a Nordstrom's, vets that the manufacturer isn't hiring children, isn't exploiting their workers. Um, we need more of those kind of the good seal, you know, housekeeping, good seal of improvement, um, because com many companies here in the U.S., you know, they can't go abroad to find out what kind of business it is. Um, can't find out, but um, they rely on the these kind of major vetting organizations. So um, there's a lot of work to be done in that. But yeah, the enmeshment of labor and trafficking is is one that's very troubling. Liz, thanks so much for a really informative talk. That was great. Let's give her a